can we really uh, explain the complexity of life that we see upon the earth without having a creator? Uh, and when we look at the evidence of creation, it's absolutely overwhelming, isn't it? Uh, and you certainly cannot uh, have such a complex system of life without having a creator. And so we think that it's logical for us to accept that God indeed has got a purpose with the earth and that the Bible is God's revelation of his plan and purpose with the earth, with all mankind. And within its pages, we learn that God is intending to fill the earth with his glory. And in the Garden of Eden, man transgressed the law of God. And as a sad and as a direct result of that, he became subject to death. He was cast out from God's presence. And the Bible reveals how man will be reunited with his God. How man will be reunited with God and live forever upon the earth in harmony with his creator. Uh, and it's a journey. It's a way of life, isn't it? And there's two ways. There's the narrow way and that that leads us to the kingdom of God. Or there's the broad way. Many are going in that way and it leads to the grave. As Jesus said in Matthew's gospel record, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. In fact, he goes on to say that few there be that find it. And there are only, there are, these are the only destinations for mankind in the journey of life. We're either going to go to a place of glory in the kingdom of God or we're going to end up in the grave, aren't we? So it's, it's, it's a choice, isn't it? Uh, and that's why there's so few that are going to attain to the kingdom of God, because God gave man free will, didn't he? We've got the free will to cho choose. God didn't compel uh, Adam and Eve uh, to obey him. They had the free will, didn't they? And so it's your choice, isn't it? Do you want the joy of the and the etern, uh, eternal life in the kingdom of God? Or are you going to be content to live your life and to die and to end up in the darkness and the coldness of the grave? If you want to be in the kingdom of God, then the Bible's the only guide that can lead you and guide you on the way. It's been likened, as it not, to a road map. And you know from experience, don't you? If you follow the map, then you will arrive in your destination. But if you ignore the map, if you make your own way in life, you're certainly going to end up in the wrong destination. You're going to end up in the grave, and that's going to be a place, place of permanent, uh, permanent death. So the Bible is a, a good road map, isn't it? It's something we can trust because God, well, God's its author, isn't it? And it was written by holy men of God under the direction of the Spirit of God. And God's made a very wonderful promise in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. And what he said is this, I will do nothing except he reveal his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And God's words of, of prophecy is as a light that shines in a dark place. In fact, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we're guided through the wilderness of life by the, the road map, by the word of truth. We can't be guided by man's thinking. If we do, we're going to stumble in darkness. We're going to lose our way and we're going to end up in the grave. So if we desire eternal life, if we want to arrive in our correct destination, then what we've got to do, we've got to follow the map. We've got to follow the words of God in the Bible. And the Bible is, is one, isn't it? And yet there are many churches. And the Bible was written by holy men of God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible alone is that which can make you wise unto salvation. In the second of Timothy and chapter 3, we read this, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
the Holy Scriptures, God's word, is able to make you wise unto salvation. But of course, it's undeniable, isn't it? There are thousands of different religions. And so our question is, why? Why are there so many different systems of belief? Are all those systems based upon the Bible or, or have they added things to it? Have they taken things away from the word of God? We got a warning in Revelation chapter 22, haven't we? That if any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. If we add, if we take away from the Bible, we're going to lose our way. We're going to lose our hope of eternal life. And so here we've got a, a pie chart, I think they call them. Uh, and that shows us the major religions of the world. And you can see the breakdown there, can't you? Well, all Christians claim uh, to base their beliefs on the Bible, but there are some religions that add to its teaching. The Book of Mormon, for example, is one example where they've added to the word of God. And then we've got the Muslims. Main sacred text is the Quran. It's a written manuscript. It's claimed to con contain the oral revelation given to Muhammad in 610 by the angel Gabriel. But they use other sacred texts as well, or they call them sacred. The Sunnah, uh, a record of the practices and the examples of Muhammad's life. The Hadith, which contains reports of what he said or approved. And then we've got the Hindus, another group. Their beliefs are, are based on the Vedas, which is a, a selection of, uh, of texts which uh, they claim they receive from God and they passed on by word of mouth. Well, there's others as well. We could go on, couldn't we? There's Buddhism, an Indian religion attributed to the teaching of the Buddha. And early Buddhist texts we find to be very inconsistent. They're not solid and concrete like the Bible. Um, his social background, the details of his life, it's all very difficult to prove. There's no precise dates. It's all very uncertain. And then, of course, there's another big group, which we would call other religions. Uh, and all these have got different belief systems. Many follow the teachings of their founder, and some of which we would describe as, as texts, wouldn't we? Sects. And then we've got... Well, probably the largest group in the world today, what we would call non-religious groups. And humanism has been classified as a religion today. And they've all got one thing in common. They're all following the thinking, man's own thinking. And the Bible teaches us that the thinking of man is enmity with God. So when you look at that, in actual fact, what you see is that two thirds of the world's population follow teachings that are not Bible based. Only one third claim to be Christians. Those who base their teachings on the Bible as being the foundation of their faith. And among that group of so-called Christians, we find there are some 37 million churches in the world and there are 34,000 Christian denominations. So many churches with many different doctrines. And so we ask this question, how has the preaching of the apostles, how has the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one gospel, the one faith, become 34,000 different versions? And the Apostle Paul made it very clear when he resisted those who would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's what we read together. And what did he say? He said, look, anyone who taught another gospel was accursed. Remember Galatians 1 and verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Even if it was an angel, even if it was Paul himself or the apostles, let him be accursed. 
And that's a first principle that we've got to turn to, we've got to hold fast the gospel that was first preached by Jesus and by his disciples. And you know, the Apostle Paul was reduced to tears because he knew, even in those early days, he knew that the purity of the pure gospel was going to be corrupted by men from within. They would be speaking perverse things. And this is what he says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves enter, entering in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Just as Paul knew that the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ would be corrupted, so it has indeed been polluted by the thoughts and by the teachings of men. So how do we hold fast to the true gospel? You know, it's a well-known saying, and it's incorrect, isn't it? But we often say that, that well, well, this is a correct saying, actually. It's a well-known saying that the closer we get to the source, the purer is the water. And that's why as Christadelphians, we go right back to the very beginning, to the source, to the original teaching of Jesus and the apostles, to the gospel that was preached by Paul. And that's the pure, that's the unadulterated gospel message. Uh, and that's the authority for the doctrines that we hold. Now, here I'm going to show you a chart. It's not got all 34,000 on, by the way. But here's a chart that shows just how the one church became corrupted and divided into these many denominations. They all claim the same source, but all teaching different doctrines. And we believe that Christadelphians, we're, we, we should be right there at the very top with that gospel preached by Paul and the apostles, the pure uh, doctrine, the pure gospel, straight from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the source. Now, the one church, we see corrupted the doctrine, and that corruption has continued even to the present day. So today, what we got, we got Roman Catholics, we got evangelicals, we've got Protestants, we got the Church of Wales, we got Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and 34,000 of them, all with different teachings, many of which we're not going to find in the Bible. And although there are many false religions have arisen, it's still true for us to say there's only ever been one true church. And these divisions, they're all corruptions from that one gospel that was preached by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul emphasize the unity of the true people of God. And he called upon the believers in Ephesus that they should walk worthy of their vocation. And he said, look, you should endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And he emphasizes the unity that should exist by using that word one. You see that word one there? And uh, Ephesians 4, and verse um, verse three to six, there's one body, one spirit, even as you're called by one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And the purpose of their fellowship together is that they should be united and grow to be more like their Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians four, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God into a perfect man, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so we find there is no truth in the expression that all faiths lead to God. There's only one faith. It was the, the, the gospel that was taught by Jesus and his apostles, and it's able to make us wise unto salvation. 
And so we've got a problem, haven't we, when we're confronted by so many varied and confusing teachings. Where do we begin? Are we going to place our trust in science? Are we going to lean on philosophy? Are we going to believe the teachings of men? Or are we going to turn to our Bibles and the things which God has revealed? Now, science might prolong your life for a time, but it's only God that can give you everlasting life. To use the words of a a Christadelphian book called Elpis Israel, we read this. It is then to the word of God, the Bible, that we must turn if we would be wise in divine things. Turn to the word of God. And, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. It's a free invitation. So in Isaiah 55 and verse 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's an invitation. It's without money. It's without price. The word of God is free to all. And yet mankind, well, they spend all their time and all their effort and all their money on things which satisfy not, things that won't profit. And God calls upon us to listen, doesn't he? Incline your ear. Come unto me and hear and your soul shall live. We've got to listen. We've got to hear the voice of God not the voices of those so strident in the world that would add and would take away from the word of God. And we can place all our trust and all our confidence in God's word because it's he's the author. It's God-breathed, isn't it? We're told by Timothy in chapter 3 in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, uh, for um, for instruction in righteousness. And the word inspiration there, as you probably know many of you, means divinely breathed. God's word, although written by men, was divinely breathed. You know, God's word, it, it's not the work of men, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. God's power moved men to write. How else could we have these accurate prophecies of future events revealed in our Bible. And so Peter tells us, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So many churches, so many false doctrines. How do we see through the fog, through the mist? How can we see clearly the things of the original gospel? And I think you could probably compare it to, well, maybe you've moved house and you know what that's like. And you're sorting through all the the, the pile of rubbish and junk that you've uh, accumulated over the years. And you know there, there's something very precious. It's like searching for hidden treasure, isn't it? We've got to remember, you know, God hasn't created all this junk, all this rubbish that's in the in the. Uh, in the churches today, that's come from the teachings of men. So we've got to search, haven't we, for hidden treasure. We've got to look for the things that have been revealed by Almighty God. We've, we've got to go back to the source. And it's not easy to sort out the true gospel from the false teachings that have been brought in by those who who saw who Paul saw were going to bring in these perverse things. But, you know, God's given us a test. And this is the test in Thessalonians. Prove, prove, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. You know, l- wonderful little theme here. In Isaiah, for example, Isaiah says, if they speak not according to this word, is because there's no light, they're in darkness. And so it's only with the Bible in hand that we can uh, that we can consider some examples of Bible teaching that have been corrupted by Christianity today. For example, two of the, ma- the main and the common beliefs 
which we don't find in our Bibles, is that of the immortal soul and of going to heaven. And the Bible teaches quite clearly that man is mortal, no immortal soul. Man doesn't go to heaven, but he remains in the grave. Only those who have walked in God's way, looking for the right destination, following the map, will be resurrected from the grave to find a place in the kingdom of Almighty God. And you know, there's many other teachings that are not Bible-based, but just let's have a, a very quick look at a couple of them. Firstly, this belief that man has got an immortal soul. That's taught by Catholics, that's taught by Protestant mainstream churches. But really, its true origin lies in pagan philosophy. And that was later adopted. It was brought into the apostate church as it brought in things from outside. You know, if a soul is claimed to be ever living, it cannot die. And, you know, then you've got a problem. Well, where's the soul going to go? Uh, and thus there was the need for a doctrine of heaven going, of another false doctrine. And they teach that in order to pro provide a, a dwelling place for these souls who they say cannot die. Well, the Bible, as we know, doesn't teach anything concerning an immortal soul. Adam knew that if he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that he would die. The sentence was, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the first lie was spoken by the serpent, wasn't it? Thou shalt not surely die. That's what the world believes, isn't it? The lie of the serpent. The same lie taught and believed by Christians today. The true teaching of the Bible is the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And so the true hope of the Bible is not going to heaven. It's in a resurrection from the dust of death. We all die. We're all going to be buried in the dust of the ground. But those who follow the way, who follow the map, who follow the Bible, who follow the one true faith taught by Jesus and the apostles, they're not referred to as being dead. They're referred to as merely sleeping. And so Daniel says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. They awake to judgment. The wicked, we're told, on the other hand, well, they're not going to wake. They sleep a perpetual sleep. And Paul described this whole process of resurrection of those that sleep are uh, awaking. And we got it here in 1st of Thessalonians chapter 4. And this is what he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you from the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, he's coming back, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those sleeping in Christ will be raised at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, if you want further evidence, the Bible's full of it. But this doctrine of heaven going is false. And if we consider the example of David, of David, remember David, he was described, was he not, as a man after God's own heart. And yet, you know, David, the man after God's own heart, we're told in Acts chapter 2 and verse 29, he's dead and he's buried and his tomb is with us unto this day. He didn't go to heaven, did he? He's there, he's dead and buried. Secondly, the gospel taught in the first century very clearly preaches the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. These are passages, there's no way round. Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, 
so shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's going to come back. There is no longer, uh, and this is no longer the teaching of those churches. They believe in heaven going, don't they? But the scripture continually, consistently speaks of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. Just have a look at Psalm 2, verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And Jesus is going to come. He's going to rule from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And, and that's why we've seen uh, over after 2,000 years, we've seen the Jews return, the scattered Jews have returned to Israel. And that's why the claims of the Palestinian people are false. Israel is God's given homeland to the Jewish people. And all efforts, and it's current today, isn't it? All efforts to remove the Jews from Israel are destined to fail. And the gospel message is of a resurrection to life upon the earth. To the establishment of the kingdom of God with the Lord Jesus Christ as king, over all the earth, to a wonderful time of righteousness and peace. We don't see much righteousness. We don't see much peace in the earth today, but it's going to come. There's one Bible. It reveals to us one faith. Those who preach another gospel, says Paul, even if they're angels, let them be accursed. So what do we need to do? Just imagine the anguish you would feel if you misread the map, if you end up in the grave with no way out. Those who've had opportunity to be, in the, to be in the kingdom, but they've lost their way. Just imagine the joy and the gladness of those who attain to the kingdom. Well, we won't go there, but Isaiah tells us on a couple of occasions that the ransom of the Lord shall return and they shall come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads and they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And we've got a wonderful example in scripture of what we should do. It's an example of those who search the Bible for themselves. And in this godless age, when so much of what we're told and what we hear is false, we need to follow the example of those who search the scriptures daily. And many of you know who I'm talking about. And we read about the noble Bereans who search the Bible for themselves. Verse Acts 7, 17, verse 11. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. If we want to know the true gospel, then it's back to the source, the pure and adulterated gospel message of Jesus and his apostles. We must turn back to that, mustn't we? I'm going to conclude with a word of warning. Even during the lifetime of the apostles, men were already corrupting the teachings of Christ. How much worse are things today? 34,000 different variations. And the apostle John warned those in his day. He says, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. We've got to go back to the true gospel. So, are you in the family of God? Are you abiding in the true doctrine, the, the true teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you following the 34,000 variations of false teaching? Well, that's the slide we started with. It depicts to us the way of life. There's one Bible, there's many churches. There's only one faith. And we've got to consult our Bible. We've got to search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. And if we don't, you, may, you will certainly end up in the wrong destination.